Hello, this is Steve Zuckerman in Baton Rouge. Going to be talking to you a little bit about localization in the field of neurology. In the field of neurology, perhaps more so than any other clinical discipline, the history and physical is extremely important. The reason for that is that various region or specific areas of the nervous system, independent of the pathology, produce very predictable symptoms and signs. And so by use of taking a directed history and performing a directed specific neurological exam, very often uh, we are successful in localizing the area of the nervous system that is causing the disease process. So neurology is just like real estate in that location, location, location is of paramount importance. And once we understand where the problem is, we've gone a great deal into figuring out what the problem is. So we just take into account the time course of the onset of the symptoms of presentation and come up with a fairly specific differential diagnosis. These talks or interactions will be split up according to the various divisions of the neuraxis that you can see listed on this slide. I mentioned that these may be interactive in that there may be regions of the slide which you can either click or roll over with your mouse in order to make further information pop up, such as additional diagrams or even being taken out to other websites for further information. This talk is going to concentrate on the localization of signs and symptoms referable to the cerebral cortex. Non-neurologists tend to think in terms of the left hemisphere controlling language and the right hemisphere controlling memory or visual spatial elements. Uh, and in general, that's true, but as neurologists, we should be able to further localize both which side, which lobe, and which area within each lobe the actual pathology may lay in order to explain all of the findings. First thing that needs to get established is which hemisphere is in fact the dominant hemisphere. Now you would think that this would be relatively easy, but it's actually fairly complicated. And this graph shows what percentage of people are in fact right hemisphere dominant. And there is a linear relationship between their degree of handedness and the extent to which the right hemisphere is dominant, such that at uh, the lowest level, which is somebody who's completely right-handed, 4% of those people have a right hemisphere dominant. If somebody is completely mixed, i.e. ambidextrous, truly, then they have a 15% chance of having a right hemisphere dominance. And at the opposite extreme, in those people who are 100% left-handed, they have the maximum, which is 27% of those people are right hemisphere dominant. Now, since there is a linear relationship, as you can see by this graph, there's actually a formula that can be applied that we'll talk about in the next slide. And here is that relatively simple formula showing that the percentage of people with right hemisphere dominance is equal to 15% minus the handedness of that person divided by 10. So if you're completely right-handed that would be 100% divided by 10, which is equal to 10, or 15 minus 10, or about 5% will be right dominant, whereas totally left-handed people, their handedness would be considered to be negative 100, and so negative 100 over 10 is negative 10, and 15 minus a negative 10 equals 25%, so it works out pretty well mathematically.
However, if you're uh, really uh, in need of determining which hemisphere is dominant, there is a test called a WADA, W-A-D-A test, in which uh, your carotid gets injected with a short-acting barbiturate amitol truth serum, and after that, half of the brain has been paralyzed or deactivated, then uh, they determine whether or not you, in fact, retain the ability to utilize language. As I speak about each of the four different lobes, I'll first discuss signs and symptoms uh, that are present in both hemispheres, and then if there are specific signs for the individual hemispheres, we'll discuss those. So that in the frontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex is responsible for the maintenance of your personality and your initiative, and characteristically, if there's bilateral frontal lobe damage or dysfunction, you become very withdrawn, you have very little interest, you, you interact minimally with your environment, and that's described as being abulic. Uh, in the supplementary motor cortex area, there is the control over eye movement and head turning so that the left frontal eye field connects to the brain stem in such a way that the eyes move to the opposite side. And so in a stroke, the eyes will turn towards that hemisphere or away from the hemiparesis. Um, on the contrary, if there is a seizure which comes from that region and activates those centers, then the eyes will be having a forced deviation to the opposite side in what's termed an aversive seizure. And finally, we have our old friend, the uh, motor homunculus in the precentral gyrus, which is responsible for contralateral uh, movements. In patients who are left hemisphere dominant in the left frontal lobe, one finds not only the frontal eye fields, but posterior to that, Broca's area, and so a left hemisphere lesion will cause an aphasia of Broca's type. And here is a depiction of our friend, Mr. Motor Homunculus, with um, a representation of the area of the cortex responsible for the control of the different body parts. And as you can see, there's an inordinate um, amount of cortex devoted to control of the hand, face, and tongue muscles parietal lobes with the post-central gyrus containing our other friend, the sensory homunculus, is predominantly sensory in its function bilaterally. And here is Mr. Sensory Homunculus, and you can see there's a little bit of a difference in the cortical rep representation areas in the motor versus the sensory homunculus. Again, assuming a left hemisphere dominance, a left parietal lesion will result in a Wernicke's type aphasia. And if the lesion is in particular in the angular gyrus, it can produce a tetrad of symptoms which are grouped under the rubric of Gerstmann's syndrome. And those symptoms would include finger agnosia, so you request the patient recognize or show to you uh, different fingers, thumb, little finger, index finger, they're unable to do so. Uh, there is a right-left confusion, so you say touch your left ear with your right hand. There is a inability to calculate a calculia, so you ask them to do a simple arithmetic. You can still do um, serial seven from 100 or add five plus seven. And then interestingly, there is an agraphia without alexia, so that the person can read, but they can't write. Non-dominant parietal lobe lesion can cause 
hemineglect on the left side or agnosia, the absence of ability to recognize disease. And these can lead to apraxia of dressing so they won't put their left side sleeves or pant legs. Uh, they'll have visual spatial abnormalities leading to uh, geographic apraxia. And temporal lobe is important for learning and memory, as well as olfaction. The occipital lobes, of course, are the site of both primary and associative visual cortex, and dysfunction of those regions can produce some fairly unusual or bizarre symptoms. If you become blind, you can have hallucinations as what's referred to as a release phenomenon, and that is that area of the brain no longer gets external stimulation, but perhaps attempts to stimulate itself and causes those perceptions. And in the case of visual release phenomenon, that's called a Charles Bonnet syndrome, which is difficult because my insurance agent is Charles Bombet, but he's not blind, so I should be able to tell the difference. Uh, there is a another agnosia, inability to know, from the Greek, prosopagnosia, which is you can't recognize what should be a very familiar phrase. Bilateral occipital lobe dysfunction can lead to blindness, and uh, you know it's not ocular mediated because you'll have normal pupillary reactions and another agnosia inability to recognize disease when you're blind is called Anton syndrome so a patient is completely blind yet is apparently not aware of that and believes that they can see things despite obvious inability to see and then there is another very unusual syndrome, balance syndrome, which I guarantee you'll see, but only on a test and probably never in a patient, in which you have uh, these three different phenomena: uh, simultaneous nausea, which is uh, basically inability to see the forest for the trees so that you can see individual details of the visual fields, but you can't put it all together to make any sort of coherent sense of what uh, is out there. Then there is an oculomotor apraxia, which is an inability to fixate your eyes, so it'll keep dancing around. And then there is an optic ataxia, which is uh, you can see something, but you can't get your hand to grasp it because uh, deficits in your, in your visual perceptions. Again, though, that would be very rare, but it is kind of interesting. Another occipital cortical syndrome which can occur is the phenomenon of alexia without agraphia, so that you can write, but you can't read. So if you can have a patient write something and then a couple of minutes later ask them to read what they had recently written, and they're unable to do so, and that um, happens as a result of a dominant or left occipital hemispheric lesion. And as a result of that, the patient will have a right homonymous hemianopsia, and of course can't see visual information to the right side, will be able to see information in their left visual fields. However, that information will not successfully be passed to a language associative region, that of uh, recognizing words, because that same occipital lesion will cause an ischemia or a stroke in the splenium of the corpus callosum. So uh, there is no longer the ability to transfer data from the right occipital lobe to that langu language associative region, and so uh, people are unable to, to read, but there are um, Broca's region is left um, completely unaffected and it can write. This last slot are listed some of the physical findings that one expects.
when there are cortical lesions, and those include the higher cortical functions in language, in apraxia, and especially in agnosias. Uh, usually cranial nerves are spared, though there can be a forced deviation with the frontal eye field's involvement. Cerebellum is usually normal. If the motor exam is affected, it's usually with face and arm greater than leg because of the distribution of the motor homunculus. The sensory exam is pretty much the same. You'll expect to see an increase in the dependent reflexes and positive Babinski's given that these are the location of upper motor neuron uh, deficits.